Energy is not just another commodity. It's absolutely fundamental to our modern civilization. Everything we do, from feeding ourselves to staying warm to manufacturing medicines, requires energy input. And not all energy sources are created equal. A barrel of oil contains about 50 times more energy than the most advanced viable battery of the same weight. This gap is never going to close significantly. It can't. The energy a battery can supply is dependent on the flow of electrons between different materials, each of which can provide a certain number of electrons for any given weight. You can improve the battery's charging time or durability or the number of times it can be charged before it starts to fail, but you can't change the fundamental composition of the materials available any more than you can change lead into gold. Batteries then are heavy and they're going to remain that way. This is not a problem for many applications including phones, laptops and small household devices. In these cases, the lower energy density isn't a major drawback since the devices are small and frequently rechargeable, and weight isn't a limiting factor in their performance. But for things that need energy input to move, cars, trucks, planes, the extra weight creates a cascading series of problems. A heavier vehicle needs more energy to move, which means that it needs bigger batteries, which means adding yet more weight, which means that more energy is needed to move it. Thanks to this weight penalty, electric vehicles often require significantly more raw materials in their construction and more energy in their day-to-day -day operation than their advocates admit. Aircraft face uniquely stringent weight considerations. Every kilogram of battery reduces payload capacity, while, unlike fuel, batteries don't become lighter during flight. So the reduced payload that would result from using batteries means fewer passengers or less cargo per flight, which in turn means we would need to schedule more flights to move the same number of people or amount of goods. In addition, aircraft combustion engines operate at relatively steady speeds. There's not much acceleration or deceleration, no sitting in traffic, and no braking from which energy can be recouped. Since there is a direct relationship between weight and range or payload, aircraft are naturally incentivized to be as efficient as possible. So battery-powered aircraft are unlikely to work well in the foreseeable future. But what about cars? It's the policy in many developed countries to shift to electric vehicles. In the UK, they're planning to ban new sales of internal combustion cars from 2035. And in Norway, Almost 90% of new car sales are electric due to carrot and stick policies. But from a full system environmental perspective, this doesn't make sense. Since not only are there weight penalties, batteries make cars heavier and heavier cars then require even bigger, heavier batteries to move. But there are issues of energy efficiency to take into account. In any sort of combustion engine, you can convert no more than about 40% of the overall energy in fuel into usable energy. That means that even though petrol has 50 times the energy of a battery, you're only going to be able to use 20 times that energy. Batteries are different. You can convert about 90% of the energy in batteries to usable energy. And there are no tailpipe emissions. But first you have to charge the batteries and we're currently mainly using fossil fuels to generate the electricity to charge batteries. So we burn fossil fuels in big stationary engines to generate electricity, and despite being more efficient than car engines, since weight isn't a factor, these stationary engines are still only around 40 to 50 percent efficient. And by the time this electricity gets to your plug socket, charges your car, and is then converted back into motion, you're looking at an efficiency very similar to that of an internal combustion engine. And that's without factoring in the extremely energy-intensive refining processes used in the production of battery materials or the battery's limited lifespans. Hybrid vehicles done properly maximize the strengths of both combustion engines and electric systems while minimizing their weaknesses. The key point is that most vehicles spend their time operating far from their optimal efficiency point, such as when they're idling in traffic or accelerating from a standstill. 
A hybrid system allows each power source to operate when it's most efficient. A well-designed hybrid system can use regenerative braking to capture the same proportion of energy as that of a fully electric vehicle. And because hybrids don't need to carry hundreds of miles worth of battery capacity, they can achieve this with battery packs a fraction of the size of those used in fully electric vehicles. These smaller batteries can still provide enough power to allow the combustion engine to continue to run in its most efficient range. When we consider the full life cycle environmental impact from manufacturing to operation to eventual disposal, hybrids, when optimized for efficiency, have some serious advantages. The dramatically smaller battery requires far less mining of rare energy-intensive materials like lithium and cobalt. The reduced weight means less energy is needed for everyday operation, regardless of whether that energy comes from the battery or fuel tank. And because the battery isn't subjected to deep discharge cycles, it's more likely to last the lifetime of the vehicle rather than requiring replacement. And the battery pack and resulting car will be significantly cheaper and therefore more attractive to consumers. Yet current environmental policies focused exclusively on tailpipe emissions effectively penalize hybrid systems. By treating any combustion engine emissions as inherently problematic, regardless of overall system efficiency, these policies push manufacturers toward either fully electric vehicles or hybrids with much larger battery packs, which will have larger total environmental impacts when manufacturing charging and lifespan are considered. The hybrid approach acknowledges and works within fundamental physical constraints rather than trying to overcome them. Instead of fighting against the superior energy density of liquid fuels, it leverages this advantage while using electric systems to compensate for combustion engines' weaknesses. This kind of engineering optimization, working with physical laws rather than against them, should be at the heart of our environmental policies. Unfortunately, it is not. Then there's the peculiar cost structure of renewable energy. With electricity generated from fossil fuels and nuclear, the major driver of cost is the fuel itself. But renewable energy is different. There's no fuel cost, so the generated electricity cost depends on the price of the equipment. Manufacturing solar panels, wind turbines and batteries requires energy-intensive processes, enormous amounts of capital investment and industrial ecosystems. To make our domestic industries economically competitive, we need energy costs that are comparable to those of our competitors. And if we're using renewable energy, that means the equipment costs must be as low as possible. So as we pursue aggressive renewable targets, we become increasingly dependent on countries where the equipment can be manufactured more cheaply than it can in the West, especially in the case of electric vehicles. It's a vicious cycle. We buy from countries where equipment is cheapest, helping those countries develop their manufacturing expertise, industrial ecosystems and economies of scale. It becomes increasingly unreasonable for us to try to build our own equipment as we lack the resources to do it for anything near the cost we can buy it for. And since our energy costs are now tied to equipment prices, and energy costs are a major factor in industrial competitiveness and are politically sensitive in a democracy, any attempt to adopt higher-priced, domestically produced equipment would result in higher energy costs and further undermine our industrial competitiveness and economic stability. One country appears to understand the dynamic perfectly. China has used its cheap coal-powered manufacturing base and massive subsidies to become the dominant producer of green technology. They seem to have recognized that, paradoxically, the more aggressively Western nations pursue renewable energy targets, the more dependent they become on fossil fuel-powered Chinese manufacturing. So while we in the West pursue aggressive renewable targets and shut down dirty industries like oil and steel production, we're not necessarily reducing global emissions, but we are becoming increasingly dependent on nations like China with fewer environmental controls. 
This numbers are stark. China currently produces over 80% of solar panels, around 65% of wind turbine components, and over 75% of lithium batteries. Western manufacturers are increasingly struggling to compete. So how did we get here? Why does the UK government think it is ecologically sound to shutter their oil industry with its extremely stringent environmental regulations just to import oil from countries with laxer standards? Why are we being forced to adopt electric cars at the expense of our automobile industries, our environment, and poor Congolese miners? Why did Germany abandon energy diversity and security in favor of imported Russian gas, with the predictable consequence of geopolitical imbalance and the decimation of their industrial base? I think there are a few reasons for our energy policy failures. A misguided wish to do good is one, and total ineptitude is another. But there may also be some powerful financial incentives involved. Imagine you're managing a massive investment fund. Traditional industries, oil, automotive, manufacturing are stable, but provide only small returns. 8% annually, if you're lucky. Then you notice something interesting. There are a host of green technology companies. They're not yet profitable. Maybe they're making electric cars that cost too much, or solar panels that can't compete with coal. But unlike traditional companies whose success is unpredictable, these companies' success depends almost entirely on government policy. You can invest heavily in these companies while their stocks are cheap, then use your financial influence to push for policies that would make their products mandatory. This is not even that expensive. All it will take is a few strategic political donations, funding for friendly research institutes, aggressive PR campaigns about climate urgency. Maybe you can start a few environmental investment funds and write some stern letters to other companies about their carbon footprints. And suddenly, magic happens. Governments start mandating electric vehicles. They ban gas heating in new homes. They require utilities to buy renewable energy. They create carbon credit markets out of thin air. They give people tax credits for buying your company's products. Now those unprofitable companies you invested in are sitting on government-mandated markets. Their stock prices soar. You point to these returns to attract more investor money, which gives you even more influence to push for more favorable policies. Traditional companies, seeing the writing on the wall, start investing in green technology too, often by buying from or partnering with your companies. Better yet, you've created a politically bulletproof position. Anyone who questions these policies can be dismissed as a climate denier. The environmental movement provides grassroots support. The companies you've invested in hire armies of lobbyists to protect and expand their advantages. The more money piles in, the more people become dependent on keeping the cycle going. It's self-reinforcing. Investment drives policy, policy drives profits, profits drive more investment. Traditional energy companies are increasingly starved of capital, making their products more expensive, which makes alternatives look more attractive, driving more investment into those alternatives. And you, the investor, are not even doing anything illegal. You're just investing responsibly and advocating for sustainable policies. The fact that you happen to own the companies that benefit from these policies? Well, that's just good business sense. This isn't to suggest that green technology is unimportant, but it helps explain why certain solutions get pushed so aggressively despite being environmentally dubious at best. Follow the money and suddenly a lot of environmental policy starts making more sense. These companies trumpet their responsible transition and sustainable energy initiatives with elaborate promises about hydrogen projects and carbon capture schemes, schemes that often make little sense. They have no choice. Without the right ESG, environmental, social and governance credentials and green initiatives on their websites, they won't win contracts or secure financing. Even traditional energy companies, whose core business is simply drilling wells or laying pipelines, must now wrap themselves in the language of sustainability and transition to stay in business. 
It's a good illustration of how thoroughly this green investment cycle has captured the entire energy sector, forcing even the most practical industrial companies to play along with and lend credibility to initiatives they must know are fundamentally flawed. The only way to truly minimize our impact on the planet is to reduce energy consumption, not CO2 or methane emissions, but energy consumption full stop. But not only would no one profit from that, but it collides with our fundamental desire for progress. After all, who doesn't want a better life for themselves and their children? Throughout history, increased energy use has meant better health care, more comfortable homes, greater mobility, and access to technologies that make our lives easier and more enjoyable. It's not practical, reasonable, or fair to reduce consumption significantly. Instead, we must take a more nuanced approach, maintaining our fossil fuel and nuclear operations to ensure reliable, affordable energy. This will help preserve our economic and industrial strength while allowing us to pursue our environmental priorities and continue to independently develop green technologies at a pace that makes sense. Otherwise, the West is likely to become ever more dependent on nations that prioritize practical policies over environmental concerns. There are fundamental physical limits to battery technology, energy storage, and renewables. A sensible path forward would mean keeping our existing energy infrastructure running while gradually adopting renewables where they make practical and economic sense, not based on arbitrary targets. An energy transition will happen naturally when alternatives become genuinely competitive, but forcing it prematurely through policy will create far more problems than it solves. The current approach to energy and environmental policy isn't just unsustainable, it has put us on a collision course with reality. When that collision happens, the economic and social disruption will be far more severe than it would have been had we taken a more measured, reality-based approach from the start. Nature doesn't care about our policy targets, investment strategies, or collective wishful thinking. We ignore its laws at our peril. 